Hi, I'm Julia Lupton from the Department of English in the School of Humanities, and I'm really excited to get to talk to you today about the UCI's new Shakespeare Center, uh, which is a great venture between the School of the Arts and the School of Humanities. Uh, give you a little bit of a sense of some of our activities, and also give you a window into the way in which I teach Shakespeare here at UCI, both to my undergraduate students and also in various community settings. And because we don't have a whole lot of time together, I'm going to focus on one speech, which is Macbeth's famous, Is That a Dagger?, which I see before me. Uh, this speech occurs early in the play. Uh, Macbeth is the host to King Duncan. And uh, the witches have led him to believe that he's going to be king of Scotland himself, but he needs to do a few things to make that happen. And of course, that's going to involve killing King Duncan in his bed. Well, Macbeth is not a naturally evil guy. Uh, he has some moral compass. He has a sense of honor that he's developed through his military and aristocratic kind of training. And actually killing someone on the battlefield is part of his job description, but killing an elderly man in his bed in Macbeth's own castle is something which really requires Macbeth to transform and redirect and kind of blunt his own moral capacities. He, of course, has a great partner in this activity, his wife, Lady Macbeth, but he has to do some of this work himself as well, and that's really what we see in this very, very famous early scene. Macbeth is on his way to killing the king, uh, but he is still beset with a kind of mounting sense of anxiety and uncertainty about whether this is the right thing to do and what the consequences for his own personhood, what the, they would have called in the Renaissance his soul, would be from this deed. And as he's um, going towards the king's bedchamber, uh, he hallucinates a dagger. And so this is just an amazing scene, um, filled with great questions for directors and actors, and also great questions for moral philosophers and for literary critics like myself. So what I'd like to do is actually uh, turn to a master, Ian McKellen, one of our great living Shakespearean actors, and have McKellen take us through this scene. This is from a performance from the 1970s, directed by Trevor Nunn. It's based very closely on a very important stage production, which took place in Stratford in their more experimental theater. And so rather than having a lot of effects, all of the actors were seated in a circle on the stage, and the center of the circle was lit, and the actors would enter into that space and deliver their lines, interacting with each other, and then never actually go off stage. They would then rejoin the circle. So this was a very, um, very experimental and influential production, and this video is based on that production. So let's, let's hear Ian McKellen uh, hallucinate the dagger. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. Or have they not? I need to see thee stop. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind? A false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain. I see thee yet in a form as palpable as this, which now I draw. The marshal smell the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses. Or oh, else worth all the rest. And see thee still. And on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood, which was not so before. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes. For the one half world nature seems dead. And wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings 
and withered murder, alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf, whose howls his watch thus, with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing stride, toward his design moves, like a ghost. A sure and firm said earth, hear not my steps which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prate of my whereabouts, and take this present horror from the time which now suits with it. As I threat, he lives. I go. And it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan. It is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. Ian McCallum is pretty great. Uh, so I want to take you now just through the different thought moments, the movements. I think of it really almost as a sonata as a or a symphony uh, that Macbeth goes through in this amazing speech. Uh, so first, of course, we get the evocation of the dagger itself, right? Is this a dagger which I see before me? And the dagger really has a number of functions in the scene. First and foremost, it's a tool, right? It's an instrument, it's a weapon, it's a tool in this case for murdering the king. Uh, it is also a symbol. Uh, it was very common in Shakespeare's English, and we see this throughout Shakespeare's own dramatic poetry, to talk about the prick of conscience. So on the one hand, this dagger points towards Duncan and Duncan's death, but it's also produced internally by Macbeth himself. And because Macbeth is a moral man, let's say unlike Iago, uh, he is someone who feels compunction. And so we can also read the dagger as symbolizing his own rising sense of anxiety and anticipatory remorse for this deed that he's about to commit. Uh, but he nowhere identifies the dagger with conscience. Um, there's really a very strong act of disavowal, of pushing back that particular origin and meaning of the dagger in order to steel himself and orient himself towards the task. And that's really the third sense of the dagger, um, the dagger as um, a, a, a cue for action. It's directional. It is, in his phrase, uh, marshalling him the way that he was going. Um, it is a kind of a one-way sign. And we can think here about how intention works in the play. To intend is to reach towards. In Latin, the in means towards, to or towards, and the tendere is to stretch. And so intention is a kind of stretching of the self, of the self's will and motives and active potential into the future, into the space of action, into new successive actualities. And so we can really see this speech as really dramatizing Macbeth's intention, his movement from intention to action, the role of the stage itself in being the space of that movement into intention. And what the dagger does is point him on his way. It is a kind of a wayfinding and prompting um, symbol. And we can see this in an image like this that I have on the screen right now. Um, sometimes the dagger is physically represented uh, as a kind of tangible object. Um, often it's not represented at all on stage, and the actor must conjure the dagger for us. Uh, he has the hallucination. We don't see it. And it's the power of the actor and his, um, his speaking being to make that hallucinated dagger resonate for us. Sometimes, as in this particular slide, um, the dagger is a kind of light effect that we can imagine occurring naturally um, in the castle, but which Macbeth, in his heightened sense of moral anxiety, interprets and encounters as a dagger. Um, but a dagger that is, again, directional, that is pointing him through the space of the stage, through the space of the castle, uh, to his deed. Um, and so we see that very much in the next movement of the speech, right? Thou marshalest me the way that I was going. Um, here it is not the dagger as a penetrative weapon, but the dagger as a, this way, <laughs> 
this way to your exodus, <laughs> this way to your action. At, at a certain key point in the speech, we have another shift, another turn. And the dagger itself seems to disappear, the hallucinated dagger. Of course, he's holding his own dagger. And part of the power of the speech is his comparing the physical dagger um, to the imagined or virtual dagger. Uh, but then the dagger um, ceases to be the main emphasis. And we really get a description of atmosphere, uh, especially sonic or sound atmosphere. And here, Macbeth is describing the night uh, there is a sense of the nocturnal soundscape being a very particular one where individual sounds are heightened, rendered uncanny, um, because other sounds have become dampened. He talks here about the curtained sleep. It's a very beautiful image that captures both the sense of interior spaces of the castle, of beds being curtained, and of course the great beds of this period were literally wrapped in fabric. We can imagine that where Duncan is sleeping is itself curtained, much like this curtained sleep that Macbeth refers to here. Um, and the night itself was often represented as a curtain, dampening the light, but also dampening the sound. And then the sounds that do emerge in that space have a kind of uncanny um, and, and terrifying quality. He refers here to the howl of the wolf, he also refers to the sound that his own steps make, right? He asks the earth to mute the sounds of his own steps so that he does not hear the consequences of his own actions as he moves towards Duncan in the bed. So we have this wonderful uh, kind of soundscape being painted in words here uh, for us in this speech by Macbeth. Uh, we also have quite a, quite a complex literary allusion in this part of the speech. Um, he compares himself to Tarquin and Tarquin's ravishing stride. Tarquin was a famous rapist from Roman history. He raped the beautiful Lucretia, who you see represented in this image. Um, he raped her in her bed. And so what Macbeth is doing here is comparing his stabbing of Duncan to Tarquin's raping of Lucrece. And this is part of a whole image pattern in the play in which murder is sexualized, <clears throat> in which Duncan is feminized, and in which Macbeth's own manhood becomes one of the weapons or tools that Lady Macbeth uses in keeping her husband on track. And so we see that language very much shaping this scene. Then in the final moments of the speech, uh, we get uh, the decision. We get the actual movement out of intentionality and into action. And this occurs in response also to a sound, to an actual sound cue, um, the sound of the bell ringing. And uh, this could be, this would be a sound that would occur off stage uh, in Shakespeare's time. We might attribute that sound to Lady Macbeth herself recalling her husband to his deed, or perhaps to the butler or housekeeper, indicating that the sleepy drinks are being served. Uh, but in any case, uh, Macbeth takes this as a cue to action that kind of shakes him out of his reverie of hallucination and kind of acoustic oversensitivity that we see earlier in the speech, and it moves him into the action itself. So let's just hear McKellen again doing this very final part of the speech. As I threat, he lives. I go. And it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it, not Duncan. It's a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. So I hope that really whet your appetite for seeing Macbeth performed. Uh, it will be part of New Swan Shakespeare Festival's offerings this summer. And I got to discuss with Eli some of his ideas about how to stage the dagger scene. I've promised not to share the solution that he'll be experimenting with, but it's quite an inventive one. And it's cer certainly something I hope you'll look for when you are at the New Swan this summer. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of support work for the New Swan as part of the new UCI Shakespeare Center. We'll be providing a series of pre-performance seminars. 
We're also instituting a new Shakespeare weekend in which you'll have a chance to study for the afternoon and then share a meal with us and then go and see the plays in performance. Um, so we're very excited about that. In addition, we'll be uh, having First Folio Fridays at the Langston Library. The folio, of course, was the sort of coffee table book that was published after Shakespeare's death by his friends and colleagues at the Globe. And they edited together all of the extant uh, plays by Shakespeare, including Macbeth. And UCI owns one of the surviving copies of the first folio, so you'll have a chance to actually see that book and learn a little bit more about its history and its significance. Uh, the UCI Shakespeare Center is also doing activities during the year. We'll be bringing back our very popular Shaken Shakespeare, which is directed by Jane Page from the Drama Department and involves a very dynamic, roving group of young people who do impromptu Shakespeare recitations in the Student Center, at the Ark, on Ring Road. Uh, wherever you see the yellow shirts, expect to hear some Shakespeare performed. Uh, this summer, we're going to be partnering with um, Shakespeare Orange County, which is in Garden Grove, and they are doing a really fascinating version of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, students at UCI will have an option to go by bus and see the play for free. It's uh, starring True Tron, who's a very popular television actor, as well as a stage actor. And in February, we are going to be uh, launching our first annual public Shakespeare lecture. And this lecture series is meant to uh, celebrate the legacy and art of Shakespeare to do so in a kind of broad, humanistic, and also experimental way that will be of interest to undergraduates and the community, as well as to theater makers and Shakespeare scholars. So we're very excited about that. Our topic is Lincoln and Shakespeare, and it will include both an academic lecture and a dramatic reading by Richard Rustoff from the Drama Department, who will share Shakespeare and Lincoln passages with us. So stay tuned for that. So we're very excited to be involved with these multi-level collaborations with humanities, arts, the library, the community, with UCI's Illuminations program, and more. And I hope to see you at some of our events. Thanks.